How many people did Ted Bundy kill? The stories of his victims. Between 1974 and 1978, serial killer Ted Bundy murdered 30 victims across seven states, but some say we'll never truly know how many people he killed. Once he eventually went to trial, the haunting stories of serial killer Ted Bundy's victims and the truth about how many people he killed while terrorizing America between 1974 and 1978 finally came out. Much of the world knows the name Ted Bundy, the infamous serial killer who murdered dozens of young women across America in the 1970s. But while his story is well known, the same is not the case for Ted Bundy's victims. How many people did Ted Bundy kill? Who were they? And how did it happen? The answers, even 30 years after Bundy's execution, remain murky. He confessed to 30 murders, but his true body count is thought to be much higher, possibly 100 or more. With recent advances in DNA profiling, it's even possible that some cold cases can still be solved. But for now, when it comes to knowing how many people Ted Bundy killed, we only have his word. Here are the women that we know Ted Bundy preyed upon and the tragic stories behind their deaths. Ted Bundy's victims in Washington and Oregon. Ted Bundy's infamous series of brutal murders are believed to have begun in Seattle, Washington in 1974. Not long after earning his bachelor's from the University of Washington in 1972, he committed his first confirmed murders. And while some believe that a 14-year-old Bundy's first victim was a girl named Anne Marie Burr, who vanished in 1961, the first of Ted Bundy's victims that's been confirmed is Karen Sparks. January, 1974, Karen Sparks. The first of Ted Bundy's victims is widely believed to be 18-year-old Karen Sparks. Also known as Joni Lenz in Bundy literature, the UW student was attacked in her sleep on January 4th, 1974. After sneaking into her basement bedroom, Bundy beat Sparks with a metal rod torn from the bed frame and then forced it into her vagina. She was one of the lucky ones. She survived, but spent 10 days in a coma and suffered permanent brain damage from the attack. February 1974. Linda Ann Healy Bundy's next victim was 21-year-old Linda Ann Healy. Healy was a popular student at UW and gave weather and ski reports at a local radio station. Her colleagues found her disappearance extremely suspicious. Police found blood on Healy's bedsheets and pillow, but not enough to indicate that she had bled to death and no indication as to where she could have gone. Her nightgown hung in the closet with a ring of dried blood around the neck, but some of her clothes, her pillowcase and her backpack were missing it seemed that whoever had bludgeoned her had crept into her room, also in the basement, and accessible via the extra key that she and her roommates kept in their mailbox, knocked her unconscious, removed her pajamas, and dressed her in fresh clothes. Three days after her abduction, according to the stranger beside me by Ann Rule, a male voice called 911. Listen, and listen carefully. The person who attacked that girl on the 8th of last month and the person who took Linda Healy away are one and the same. He was outside both houses. He was seen. Police never got the caller's name. Healy's disappearance was the first sign for police that something sinister was occurring, but it would take them a long time to suspect Bundy. Fourteen months after her disappearance, her skull and jawbones were found on Taylor Mountain, about an hour's drive from her home. March 1974, Donna Gail Manson. Donna Gail Manson, a 19-year-old student at Evergreen State College south of Seattle, disappeared on her way to a campus concert. Her body was never found, but Bundy later claimed he burned her skull in the fireplace of his girlfriend, Elizabeth Klopfer. Of all the things I did to Liz, Bundy later confessed to Detective Robert Keppel, this is probably the one she is least likely to forgive me for. Poor Liz. April 1974, Susan Elaine Rancourt. 
Like all of Ted Bundy's early victims, the 18-year-old Susan Elaine Rancourt disappeared on a college campus, this time at Central Washington State College, east of Seattle. Like many of his other victims, Rancourt was studious, a biology major with a 4.0 grade point average, and driven. She worked two full-time jobs one summer to pay for her tuition. Unlike many of his other victims, she was blonde-haired and blue-eyed. Bundy's previous victims were brunettes. At 8 p.m. on April 17th, Rancourt put a load of laundry in the washing machine and headed to her regular dorm advisors meeting. She planned to see a German film with a friend afterwards, but no one saw her after the meeting. Her clothes remained in the washing machine until a frustrated student took them out and put them in a heap on the table. Her disappearance prompted a massive search with no results. Only later, evidence mounted that Rancourt was one of Ted Bundy's victims. Did other students recall an eerie detail from the night Rancourt disappeared? They had been approached by a man named Ted who had his arm in a sling. May 1974, Roberta Kathleen Parks. Roberta Kathleen Parks was the first known Ted Bundy victim in Oregon. The student disappeared somewhere between her dorm room at Oregon State University and a coffee shop where her friends were waiting to meet her. Investigators later discovered her skull, among many others, at Taylor Mountain in Washington. June 1974, Brenda Carroll Ball, and Jorgen Hawkins. In June 1974, Bundy struck twice, on June 1st and again on June 11th. Details gathered by the police showed a striking similarity, a man displaying some kind of handicap asking for help. Witnesses last saw 22-year-old Brenda Ball at 2 a.m. outside the Flame Tavern south of Seattle, talking to a man in a sling. Others remembered a man on crutches struggling with a briefcase near the University of Washington the night sorority girl, Jorgan Hawkins, vanished. It took time for Seattle police to make the connection between this handicapped stranger and accounts from women in Ellensburg, where Susan Rancourt disappeared two months earlier. There, witnesses remembered being approached by a man struggling with a stack of books. July 1974, Janice Ann Ott, and Denise Marie Nasland. The list of Ted Bundy's victims grew again in July 1974 with the murders of Janice Ott and Denise Nasland. Bundy kidnapped both women on the same day from Lake Sammamish State Park in Issaquah, about a 20-minute drive east of Seattle. The brazen abductions happened in broad daylight. Later, witnesses reported that a man with his left arm in a sling had approached them, introduced himself as Ted, and asked for help rigging his sailboat to his car. One young woman initially obliged, but grew hesitant when she approached his brown Volkswagen Beetle with no sailboat in sight. Oh, I forgot to tell you. It's at my folks' house, just to jump up the hill, he said in a slight British accent. When he motioned to the passenger door, she bolted. A little while later, she saw another woman walking beside the man toward the parking lot deep in conversation. With this, the police finally had something tangible. The woman described the man as having sandy blonde hair, 5'10", 160 pounds, and he had a brown VW bug. They commissioned a sketch of the suspect. The police had no idea just how close they were to Ted Bundy. He worked on Seattle's suicide hotline and the Seattle Police Department even nominated him to be the director of the Seattle Crime Prevention Advisory Committee. His colleague, Ann Rule, even reported her suspicions about Bundy to the police after seeing the sketch. Although the authorities noted that Ted Bundy did, in fact, drive a bronze Volkswagen Bug, no one followed up. 